Hello everybody, really glad you could make it here today. If you're around here, thanks for dropping by, and if you are a returning viewer, it is so good to see you again. I'm in front of the camera, we're in my car, and we are at my local Walmart, if you could tell by the title of the video. But here's the thing, why Walmart? Well, this sort of relates to when I was starting out building models. I didn't have the means to afford all of these specially dedicated painting and weathering products. I just used what I could afford, and that is paint from Walmart. And this is what I want to stress to you guys, you know, money spent in this hobby is not conducive to success. You know, you could have all the money in the world, you could buy all the paints, all the streaking grimes, all the weathering products out there, but if you don't know how to use them, it's entirely useless. And on the topic of money, I'm looking to spend maybe 10 to $15, 20 is max. That's the maximum amount I want to spend today. But enough of that talking, let's make some paints. And this is the paint selection at my Walmart. It might look a bit generic, but I'm pretty sure we can find something to work with. Hopefully. So, we're back from a trip. Let's see what I've got. This is what I was able to get. One thing worth mentioning is that the shot of the Walmart craft aisle was taken after I bought these paints, and the section was completely restocked. So when I bought these, I didn't really have that much to work with. And in total, this cost $15.49, but let's take a closer look at what we've got. As you can see, I've bought some acrylic colors, which will of course be used to paint our subject. I've got 5 paints, which cost $0.54 cents each. I've got a grey for the base color, and a yellowish orange for recognition markings. The black and white will be used to lighten and darken the two, and a dark brown, which is quite versatile. I can use the brown on its own for earth effects, mix it with the black for its shipping color, or even use it with the orange for a bit of a rust effect. And versatility is something to keep in mind when buying your paints, especially if you're a new painter. But on the topic of versatility, you might be wondering why I bought a grey when I could just mix my own from the white and black, but that's because I'm using the grey as a bit of a baseline to go off of, and I'm additionally planning on using the white for a bit of a winter camouflage. I also have some oil paints, which I'm honestly quite skeptical about, since I normally use Windsor Newton oil paints, and the cost of a single tube of Windsor Newton is more than these 12 colors combined, of which a single tube costs 47 cents. The oil paints will be used to weather the model, and although I'm not planning on using all 12, I certainly could. The techniques I've got in mind are going to be fairly basic, although I am planning on using the white to help out with the winter camouflage. That should be fairly interesting, at least for me, since although I've used white oils in the past to help weather a winter camouflage, I've never used it to paint the camouflage itself. I also bought brushes, which were the most expensive thing I've got, coming in at $6.42. I don't necessarily need new brushes, but this package comes with a variety of brush styles, which will help with the different painting techniques that I've got planned. Before I can show you the painting itself, I need to get it ready for painting, and today, We'll be painting and weathering a high-grade Zaku 1 sniper type. As this is an older high-grade from 2006, there are lots of things which are in two halves, almost everything is in two halves, resulting in some seam lines and even small gaps in some places. The way I fix a lot of these is by taking the kit apart, liberally applying a mixture of Tamiya white putty and extra thin cement on the joins, and then pressing the two halves together. What I want ideally is the excess putty and cement mixture to flow out from the two halves, which shows that I've used more than enough. The Tamiya and putty mixture of course melts the plastic together, which should get rid of the seam lines. I then let everything dry and sand the excess. I don't really need to worry about the inner pieces, since those are ABS, not polystyrene, and this usually fixes everything, but if there's still a gap left over, I will fill those with Mr. White putty. And this isn't because it's necessarily better than the Tamiya putty, but it's just because that's what I've got on hand, and for sanding, I'm using a Tamiya 1000 grit sanding sponge. I'm also using a Tamiya razor saw to scribe in some separation lines in certain areas of the model that I feel need a bit more definition. Here's our Zaku ready for painting. If you can look past the simplistic nature of the older high grade releases, it's definitely one I recommend, especially since it's a bit rarer. I have no problem with simple, and this is a Zaku 1 variant, which does look pretty unique, so I have no complaints. So, let's get ready to paint this. Before painting is priming, and our kit has been primed in Mr. Surfacer 1000, which admittedly is not from Walmart. And this is something I want to address. I will never use Walmart spray paint for primer, and this is something that I just won't compromise on. 
Don't use Krylon or whatever brand of spray paints they have at Walmart for priming, especially for Gunpla. I can say this with absolute certainty because I have used these paints for primer in the past and regretted it. Krylon can go on really thick, especially if they're matte sprays, and this can restrict movement and posability. I've had Krylon dry with a texture similar to Antislip, and I also have had Krylon dry with air bubbles in it. A can of Mr. Servicer 1000 is definitely not cheap compared to that. It can usually run from $10 to $15 depending on where you get it, but it's definitely worth it. We're currently painting the Zaku, and instead of telling you how I painted it, I thought I'd tell you about what I think of Apple Barrel's acrylics because they're a little different from my standard Vallejo. Right off the bat, I noticed that they were a bit lumpy out of the bottle, although this might be because they were a little old instead of the quality of the paint itself. I have no idea how long these paints have sat on the shelves of my Walmart, it may be a couple of months, maybe up to a year, I really don't know. An additional note is that the paints even out quite well for a 54 cent paint, and I was able to apply pretty thick coats without worrying too much, although if I were you, I would play things a bit safer, stick to thin coats. The black and grey did very well coverage wise, although I did struggle a bit with the dark tan colour I mixed up. And this was probably because I applied the paint over a light grey surface, I would recommend using a black as the undercoat instead. In addition to applying the paint normally, I'm also doing some distressing just to give it a little bit of interest since even though these are two colours, they're just solid. There's no camouflage patterns or anything else going on. Distressing is pretty simple, you just mix up a colour that's slightly lighter or darker than the colour you want to distress, and then you just apply it all over the model in sort of scrubbing and stippling motions. If you'd like to see this technique done more in great detail, check out my video on painting the high grade high gog. Some video card should show up on the screen right about now. And one thing to mention about distressing is that it should look a little stark and further weathering is gonna tone it down a lot more and just make it much more palatable. Here's the Zaku after painting of course minus the backpack and weapons. And I'm honestly impressed with Apple Barrel's paints. Of course this isn't the best judgement of an entire paint company, as I did use pretty muted colours, but I wasn't expecting much. And I'm not going to go out of my way to replace my current paint supply, I have too many paints as is, but if I am in a bit of a pinch and I wasn't able to go to an actual hobby store or buy paints online, I would really consider using these paints again. You can also see the results of the distressing which I am pretty pleased with, although I would have made the distressing on the tan just a little bit more stark, although that's my personal opinion. And with this, the initial painting is complete, and we can move on to weathering. What I'm going to do first is a pin wash, or a panel line as it's called in Gunpla. A pin wash is used to highlight detail on your model by creating fake shadows with a dark color. This is usually a black, a dark brown, or a gray, which is thinned out and applied around the details. That being said, a panel line doesn't have to be exclusively dark colors. I have seen stuff done with metallics or lighter colors, but a black is the most common, so that's what I'll be showing you today. I brought out an unfinished Saku just to give you an idea of what this technique looks like when it sort of behaves. This panel line was achieved with an acrylic product, so that's what I'll be using for this video. That being said, don't use acrylics for a panel line if you can help it. They dry way too quickly to be effectively cleaned up, resulting in lots of tide marks. The way I'm trying to fight this is by thinning out the paint a lot more than usual, which makes it dry a little slower due to the greater water content. I then use a clean brush to get rid of the excess, and I'm still working as fast as I can since I want this to look as neat as possible, although our Zaku will be pretty weathered in the end, so it might work out for us. One thing to mention, when I thin out the paint as much as I do, the result is a lot more subtle, so I will have to go in multiple times just to make sure that I actually highlight the detail. And I also forgot to mention why I apply the wash first. It's so that the further weathering can hide our mistakes, especially if we're using an acrylic like I am. However, if you do use an acrylic wash, I do have one piece of advice, which is to apply it from the inside of panels. And for some reason, 
tide marks look better on the inside of panels than they do on the outside. I can't explain it, it's just something you have to trust me on. And although it's very difficult to have a very neat pin wash with acrylics, I'd actually recommend using an enamel or a oil. I can also use this acrylic wash to shade in recessed areas, which is something that I do. We're now going to start weathering the model with oil paints, but before I get to that, I wanted to do a brief comparison between the oil paints I normally use and the ones from Walmart. Of course, it's not really a fair comparison, but I just wanted to show you how thin these tubes are, and one thing I noticed with these paints is just how oily they are, and these paints are a lot less actual paint than I expected, which is a bit concerning, though these paints were less than 50 cents each, and my Windsor Newton cost 6 to 8 dollars a tube. You can see here just how much oil has leached off, and I've let these paints sit for at least 8 to 12 hours. I wanted to get rid of as much oil as possible, since the oil makes the paint dry too slowly. I usually wait 1 hour for my Windsor Newtons, although I've been using those paints for over 2 years, so I'm sure a lot of the excess oil is already gone. What I'm doing first is a dot oil filter. It's a very simple technique, and what it basically entails is you applying dots of various oil colors on your model and vertically streaking them down until very little is left. It adds some tonal variation in a very subtle way, the key word being of course, subtle. Filters are supposed to be subtle, just in general. The goal is to have a very slightly warm paint finish, although it has the added effect of tying everything together as it is a filter at the end of the day. Some pointers regarding this technique are to use similar colors to your base coat. If you have a green base coat, use greens, browns, blues, and yellows, and of course, whites. Your brush shouldn't be very wet, only slightly down. Flooding the surface with thinner gets rid of all your paint and can in some cases crack your plastic. I actually use a dry brush at first, and I only use thinner to get rid of the excess oil paint on the brush itself. A filter can also be used to shift the tonality of your paint, and although it should be subtle, your initial color will change slightly, depending on the colors you use, which is something you can use to your advantage. And this is the difference that a dot filter makes. The arm on the bottom has received a dot filter, and it looks a little warmer, a little more brown than the one on the top, which is just in the straight paint. Next up is chipping, and I've decided to do two-tone chipping. Normally, I'd only be doing single-tone chipping on my winter vehicles, but I decided to do two-tone chipping since I don't know what areas will be covered in white and what areas will be left in the grey and the brown. Two-tone chipping is pretty simple. First, you create chips with a lightened version of your base color, and then you use a darker color on the inside of those chips for a three-dimensional look. The first color, in this case the lighter grey, simulates a bit of lighter wear while the second color shows deeper chipping which is worn through the paint and gone to the primer or metallic surface underneath. When I normally do chipping, I like to use a very fine paintbrush, but none of the brushes I had would work, so instead, I used the sponge brushes. Sponge chipping is a great beginner's technique, it's as simple as dipping a torn sponge in paint, removing most of the paint, and tapping the sponge on the areas you want to be chipped up. And because the sponge is torn, it naturally creates these random chips of both different size and shape. And these are the two things to keep in mind regardless of your chipping technique, shape and size. We don't want our chips to be the same shape, and we definitely don't want our chips to be the same size. The more random the chips are, the more convincing they are as a result. Now I'm going in and adding a dark brown on the inside of the grey chips. But instead of using a sponge, I'm using the end of a brush that I've cut slightly to give a bit of a jagged edge. Because the brush is a flat brush instead of a pointed one, I'm essentially doing some dry brushing for these chips. I decided to use the brush instead of a sponge for a bit of contrast, and what I also end up creating with this flat brush is some scratched effects as well as just general chipping. I'm going back to sponge chipping, but only with a dark brown instead of two tones. I decided that the winter camouflage would go all over the Zaku, so I felt a light brown would get covered up by the white and be completely useless. Here's the result of the sponge chipping on the brown. It does show up a lot more on here as opposed to the grey. 
Sponge chipping is a technique that I shouldn't have forgotten. It's really easy to do and it looks great. I feel that shipping can be a little difficult to translate onto something humanoid as opposed to something like a tank or an aircraft, but this technique really takes the guesswork out of it. It's just as simple as tapping all over your model and it's very easy to do, so it's great for beginners. I've added a little more black to the chipping color and I'm now doing some speckling just all over the Zaku. This not only makes the model look more weathered with oil and mud splashes, it helps to unify the different colors in a very subtle way. Even though I will be applying mud in later stages, I do want to give the impression of some sort of dirt effect. And this is just some heavily thinned out brown and I'm just spreading it all over the lowest areas of the Zaku and this works the exact same way as the filter does, which is very subtly shifting the tonality of what we've got already on. I do then go in with a wide brush and do some vertical streaking motions to clean up the excess and also create subtle streak effects. I don't want the Zaku to look too dirty since I'll be applying a winter camouflage on top of this. I felt that if a mobile suit were to get repainted in any sort of camouflage, be it winter or otherwise, the people doing the painting would want it to be sort of clean. Even though I am going to be weathering this mobile suit, I do want it to seem relatively maintained. And now I'm just using that brown to do a bit more speckling. Here's our result so far. I am honestly impressed with just how far I was able to get with what I had available. If I were to say just add some actual mud effects and finish up the weapons, I'd be pleased with the final result. I do like how it looks. It gives me the impression of something that's been weathered, it's seen combat, but it is relatively well maintained by its ooze. It's worn but not abused. At this point, I think I could actually just wrap up this video since I did test out all the paints I bought, but I did say that I wanted a winter camouflage, so that's what will be happening next. It's time to apply the winter camouflage, and I want to show an overall whitewash that's a bit degraded, but not degraded in the sense that it's all chipped up. I personally think that look would be a bit distracting from what we've done so far, but instead, I want a whitewash that's just barely there. I want a hint of a whitewash. I want to give the impression that there was some sort of winter camouflage, but which is now hardly visible. And for this, I'm first making a wash with my white acrylic and water, applying it all over the model. It's a literal whitewash. I then will be getting rid of 90% of the paint with a clean flat brush. I like to use the flat brush in vertical motions for this, and this not only gets rid of paint very quickly, it will sometimes leave some streaks of white left over, and this makes it look like the whitewash was removed due to rain and the elements washing it away. If I want the white to be a bit more apparent, I can always apply more, and that's something to remember when painting, especially with acrylics. Because these paints dry so fast, I'd be in a bit of trouble if I had more paint on the model than I actually needed. As you can see, our initial camouflage has dried, and I've also painted on some stripes on one of the legs just to test things out. I wanted a little more interest and the legs didn't really have a lot going on, so that's why I've chosen to apply the stripes there. While painting these stripes, I tried to keep everything as sharp and angular as possible. I've probably said this in every video I've made featuring a camouflage of some sort, but if you make your camouflage too flowing and smooth, it doesn't have the proper insta look. We have to remember how small the people actually painting these mobile suits would actually be. Since I had let the oil paint dry out on some paper towels beforehand, the paint was very thick and a little difficult to work with. However, I did get it to manage. But why work with oil paints when I have acrylics and know how to use acrylics? It's so that I can blend them out and make them somewhat soft edged. I also wanted to try something new and show it to you guys. So I'm doing this with a soft brush. I don't know the technical name for this type of brush, but it's a very soft one and I'm just tapping the stripes. I am trying to keep the brush on the inside of the stripes so that I don't get any excess paint on the gray. After all, we're trying to remove the paint, not add more onto the Zaku. 
It also helps to have as small of a brush as possible. This one was a little too big. It was as wide as most of the stripes, but I did get it to somehow work. As you can see, I've applied some oil mud effects off camera just to experiment and I'll be showing you how to achieve a similar result. It's not going to be a perfect match since I'm applying the mud on slightly different areas, but the general technique is the same. And the only other difference would be the color. The second color I'll be showing you guys is mixed with black just to give the appearance of fresh mud. First I'm applying the oil paint on the places where I want mud, it's very simple. And since I'm going for fresher mud, I put it on the bottoms of the feet as opposed to the ankles, which show mud that's had time to dry out and is a bit older. I don't really care too much on creating patterns, I mean I do create some, but it's not my main concern, since I'll be adjusting the final appearance with a moistened brush, and what I really want is getting mud where I want it to be. The oil paint is a little too thick for my personal taste. So I'm just spreading everything out now and this will also make the blending easier. I'm doing upward streaking motion since the paint is on the very bottom and if the paint was on the top of the surface, I'd streak downwards. Just like the last stage, we don't care too much about form, it's just spreading out the paint so it's a lot easier to work with. And when I think the paint is spread out enough, that's when I go in and remove all the excess. I'm doing vertical motions just because I have a flat brush. And this is one of the areas where these Walmart paintbrushes don't really work for me. Normally for something like this, I have this really beat up angular brush, and I let the shape of that brush create all of these imperfect mud clusters, but I had to work with what I had available. However, I'm still getting it to work reasonably well. And now I'm going in with speckling with that brown oil paint just to tie everything together once more. I'm adding the final touches, and one thing I haven't added yet is metallic effects. And although I didn't buy a metallic paint, I do have a mechanical pencil, which I'm using to highlight some of the detail on the backpack, as well as to create some chipping and scratching. I'm just drawing these details in, it's as simple as that. And here's how the technique works. It's very simple and really straightforward, but it has the potential to make your model pop for a very small amount of effort. And here's our finished Zaku. I'll be adding some close-up pictures in a little bit, but I just wanted to say again how impressed I am with how these paints work, especially given the cost. And this is my message to those of you who may be starting out with painting and don't really know where to start. Model paints and weathering products seem to have become increasingly specialized. Some paints say that they're only for a certain base color or for a certain type of vehicle and even for a certain time frame. And if you just buy everything based on what the labels say, you could very well spend a small fortune. You don't need to spend a small fortune to have a pretty decent result and that's the biggest takeaway I want to show with this video. And I could honestly talk about costs and marketing for hours, but I just want to show you another Zaku that I've completed. This one was painted and weathered with dedicating modeling products and the results are pretty comparable. And it's not exactly a perfect comparison since it's not in a winter camouflage and I use different colors, but if you were to tell me that one of these was painted with really cheap acrylics and oils, I wouldn't believe you. And I'm not saying that my result is perfect, I've still got a ways to go, but I do like the finished result and I hope you do as well. And this brings us to the end of the video. I want to thank you all for watching, especially if you've stuck around this far. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you do, feel free to you know, like, subscribe, share, comment, all that good stuff. It really encourages me to put more videos out there. I really hope that you were able to learn something as well, that if you're in a pinch and you need some paints quickly, Walmart ones can have a pretty decent result. Once again, I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll be seeing you in the next one, whenever that is.